Good morning. And, um, and this morning, I want to just dive into it, and I want to preach around false gospels. Um, for those of you who don't know me, firstly, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm in the process of, uh, well, Eddie and I um, have been married for 18 years, and uh, we were in the Edgemead, leading the Edgemead congregation, uh, handed that over, and now we're in the process of moving to Wellington, which is... Um, and we'll be leading that congregation. It's a Josh Jen congregation, as, uh, 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 along with the Bible School TMT, a uh, place where you can get equipped and trained um, and spend a year of your life and up to three. So don't worry. That's not if you fail your first year. You've got to repeat. You can't fail TMT. So um, all right. So, um, so this morning I want to preach around false gospels, and I want to start by reading a scripture to you in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 to 4. Andrew mentioned the scripture yesterday, and just appropriate, feels like it is something of a theme that the Lord is wanting to do in us. And Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put it up with it readily enough. And it's very easy for us to hold to different types of gospels or other kinds of Jesuses. And sometimes we assume that we all, because we're called Christian, we assume that we must all, people must believe the same we do. There must be a sense of, you know, the same gospel, the same Jesus. But as Andrew rightly said yesterday, as we can form a picture of Jesus that's more according to culture or more according to our experience or our background or other sources or demonic sources than the real Jesus of the Bible. And sometimes that Jesus is a Jesus we don't really know because it's a picture of a person that is so much more powerful, so much more kinder, so much more gracious than I think we can ever even imagine. And I don't want to try and necessarily try and box Jesus in this morning, but I do want to try and also give you um, a, a kind of some, some pointers in terms of what Jesus is not like and, and what these gospels are not. Because Paul says here, says that you've received a different gospel. And the fear is even among us that as we want to root ourselves into Christ, is that we can find ourselves, parts of us can be rooted in the wrong thing. And we need to pull up and actually look at, identify what is it not? What is, what is the gospel not? And so I do want to kind of hit a few things this morning um, and have a look at that. So I want to look at two gospels that are not good news. And firstly, they're not good news because we see that these gospels that I want to look at will not have the power for us to overcome sin and to love God like we should. And it's very important that there's many messages out there, but the true gospel has power for it enables us to love God and it enables us to say no to sin. And I realize even for some of you, not all of us, but for some of you that are tired here, and maybe you responded, I felt this morning that you might be tired because it's like you're, it's like there's something that's actually wrong. There's, there's, there's a wrong understanding. And so you default into something that's not right. And so you get tired easily because there's no grace. You're not rooted in grace. And, and this morning, might just, even for you, there's a shift in understanding so we can be rooted properly in grace. And that often enables us not, we do all get tired, but in the sense that you find that there's grace that flows like it should. So that's the one thing that I want to look at is that it doesn't have power to enable us from, uh, to sin, as we'll see. And the second thing is that these false gospels that I want to look at actually cause Christians to be under a curse and under the judgment of God. And do you know it's possible that, that for you as a Christian that if you believe wrongly and if you preach something wrongly, you can be under a curse? Do you know that? So let's look at what Galatians says, and I'm just introducing these to you, then I want to go into it, but Paul says in Galatians 1, and he says, but even you or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach, let him be accursed. And let's look at another one in Galatians 3 verse 10, where he says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. In other words, if, you can, if you're trusting in the wrong thing, you can also be under a curse, and this curse is not from the devil. This curse is the judgment of God on those who have put misplaced trust in other things and not in the Lord. 
that they've drifted from a pure and sincere devotion from Jesus. And so this morning, it's, it's all about Jesus, isn't he? And we'll see that these Gospels, they, you know, they make much of man, but they diminish what God is like. They make much of what we should do, and they diminish actually what the Lord has done. And obviously as Christians, as we'll see, that everything we do must be in a sense a response to what the Lord is already doing, what the Lord has already done, and so we can operate out, out of that place. So, okay. You know, a funny, I was just thinking, I, I did Google um, uh, different images of Jesus. And he was, it's, careful when you do that because all kinds of weird stuff come up. But there was like, on Newsweek uh, a couple of years ago, there was hipster Jesus. You know, Jesus that wears his uh, Brett Bevan top. You know, big bearded Jesus with his skinny jeans. I'm not knocking Brett because I know Brett's not into that Jesus. But skinny jeans, he drinks craft beer and he loves creation and he loves... You know, we walked in, um, uh, myself and Cephas um, from Zambia, we, we went to St. George's Cathedral in town and took him in. And they had all these tracks against the side of the wall. And this is an old historic church, Church of England. I'm not knocking that church specifically, but as you walked in, there were tracks on the side of the wall. And do you know what the tracks, I noticed one of the tracks. In fact, none of the tracks spoke about the gospel. They all spoke about caring for creation. Now, that's important as Christians, we steward and we to look after creation. But in a sense, we're not, we're not hips to Jesus that is more concerned about creation and, and those things than it is about actually the, the, really what it's about. So, so let's look at the first false gospel. And this is the false gospel of the gospel of self-improvement. The gospel of self-improvement. And I want to say that this is what I grew up in. This is... Um, what, when I went to church, and I went to church, I was a, I was a good church boy. I, I really was. I was, I was, I was, a, I was trying to be good. I was a good man. In Wellington, I've got, we have to try and speak more Afrikaans. So at the moment, we, we're practicing hard on Afrikaans to, to prat. Daar. So for those in the Isle of Man, we'll get you an interpretation. Don't worry. And... Um, and this is the gospel of, of, of self-improvement, the idea that if I prayed more, if I obeyed more, then I would please God. Um, and this kind of Jesus is like a sports coach or a, um, a disciplinarian that comes alongside and says, come on, you can do better. Come on, that's not enough. You can do better. And he's driving you and he's pushing you. It's a Jesus that it's like, you, this is like, this is, this is sports coach Jesus. And as a Christian, for even as, uh, when I, after I was born again, and for Christian as a number of years, part of my understanding was in this kind of Jesus, a Jesus that I felt like I was never good enough. That I was always, if I didn't quite pray enough or read my Bible enough, or if I just, oh, just missed it in some areas, that I would be under condemnation. And I felt under condemnation from the Lord. And it's because I was rooted, part of my thinking, in the wrong understanding of Jesus. And you know, there's a story in Luke chapter 18 um, where Jesus uh, uh, kind of uh, tells a story of two men, a tax collector and a Pharisee. And it, it encapsulates something in the one man of his attitude that he was rooted in this, in this kind of gospel of self-improvement where he was trusting and making much of himself and putting pressure on himself, but he was trusting in his own efforts rather than the efforts of the Lord. And I want to say that even though that these are these are very fun, these are basic things we're talking about, and we, but they are foundational, and 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 this whole week has actually been very foundational. But it's so important that we don't fumble this ball because there's certain things we can assume don't fumble this ball. And so here's a story, and there's a story about a Pharisee, and I want to say that this Pharisee man, he was a good man. He was a, a church-going man. I mean, he, he, he obeyed the law. He was zealous for God. And Jesus tells us that he was self-righteous in verse 9. It says that he, those, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. And he goes through the story and he says that how the self-righteous man, the man that trusted in himself, he goes to the temple and he prays and he says this to the Lord, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers. And then he saw the tax collector, this really, man, broken, 
messed up man. Maybe he was habitually falling into sin. He was just like he was a mess. He was, he was an untouchable. And he saw that man. He said, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like that guy. I fast twice a week and I tithe of all that I get. Oh, there's something honorable about that. I don't know. When, when we read this, it's like, yes, yes. We like this guy, man. Like he's a good man. He's, he's, he's. But then, and we kind of think, okay, how's Jesus setting up the story now? Because clearly we've got the good man. And then you've got this tax collector who throws himself upon the mercy of God. And he says this, standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. That gives you an idea of the kind of guilt and the shame that he felt, realizing that he was, a, he was condemned under God. And he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he threw himself upon the mercy of God, saying, God, there's nothing good in me. I'm dependent upon you. Now, the surprising part of the story is that God justifies the man that we wouldn't expect. He justifies the tax collector. And he says this at the end in verse 14. He says, I tell you that this man, this man the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In other words, the Pharisee was trusting in himself. And he was using religion in order to make himself look good. He was using ministry. He was using good things, prayer, fasting. Those are good things, giving to the poor. Those are good things. And you know, we can do the same. Although we're not Jews, but we can do the same. And I've realized in my own life that I find, for example, there's certain days that, man, I have good days where, where I look back on my day and, and I, I kind of I lie in bed at night and I look back on my day and I realized I got up really early to spend time with the Lord this morning. Check. Yes. Okay, I read my Bible for an hour. Check. I witnessed to someone at work and prayed for a person. ka -ching! Check. Um, I, you know, hey, I tithe double this month. Lord, I've given 20%. God, oh, I'm so... And there's kind of a... And in me, I'll be honest, there's been times where there's a spiritual pride where I find myself congratulating myself for how spiritual I am. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you... <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> You say, Eva, I know I am. <laughs> and you see, all I've begun to do is I've subtly begin to trust in my own moral efforts rather than being absolutely dependent on the finished work of Christ. And I want to say that the gospel, and I'll get into, uh, wait, wait let, me, let me hold back. And then I want to look at five symptoms of where it's possible that you could have fallen into or be rooted in certain aspects of the self-improvement gospel. So there's five symptoms. Number one. You fall into condemnation easily. And when you come to this kind of Jesus, he's a Jesus that's folding his arms, and again, you feel, man, you can do better. That's a sign that you could be rooted in this kind of thinking. Secondly, second symptom, you're quick to compare yourself to other believers, and it either results in pride or in a sense of failure. And you're always comparing. You're always, like, you're always comparing yourself like, and then you, you become a leader. It's like, yes, I'm a leader. I'm not like that guy anymore. I, mean, this is, I was like that. Three, when you see other Christians struggling, the issue is always this for you. And if you're a leader and you find yourself counseling them, you find that the issue is this. They're not committed enough. That's what you're, you look at them, you say, man, these guys are not devoted enough. Don't they know Acts 242? They should devote themselves. <laughs> Where's that guy from? Mossel Bay, Monet. <laughs> no, and we would. We would say amen, and we do say amen to that. We do. We want, we want devotion. We want a sense of a people that are devoted and committed, and they've laid their lives down as unto Christ, and we do want that. But we often say, no, we, we focus on the outward. They're not committed enough, man. And we get frustrated with people. They've missed church for two or three Sundays or th two or three months, and we go and we say, where are you, man? Don't. Then, like, just get your act together, and we get frustrated with them. That's another symptom. The other symptom, number four, is you know that you might be rooted in a self-improvement gospel because you feel worthless when you aren't involved in some kind of ministry. The fifth one is that you thrive off the validation and the encouragement of others. 
You always need encouragement. Now, we want to give encouragement, but it's like you thrive off the validation of others. That if someone puts their hand on your shoulder and says, John, you're doing such a good job. It's like everything in you swells. Now, that's good. We want encouragement, but it's like you just feed off that for weeks. You know, you know Andrew said, Pastor Andrew said, no, we don't call Like Andrew said, oh, he said, I'm doing well. Like, oh, yes. And those are some of the symptoms of the self-improvement gospel. But I want to say that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is actually so different to this. Because obviously, it's not built upon our, of what we do firstly. It's, it's built upon what Christ has done. And our boast as Christians is that we are saved by good works. Yes. But it's Christ's good works. That's the work, good works of Jesus. I had you there. Okay. That's the works of Jesus. That, that's scriptures that in his obedience I've been made righteous. And, and you know the gospel we know. But let me say again, the gospel is news. But what type of news is the gospel? It's two kinds of news. The first kind of news is that you're a spectacular failure. And so the Bible would use words like sinner, enemy, accursed, alienated. And if we don't give people that aspect of, the, of, of leading up to the good news, they're always going to think that, man, I'm coming to the kingdom and God, you know, you really want me. And we come on the basis of strength rather than the basis of weakness. You know, we had uh, Peter Pollock uh, with us a few weeks ago in, in Wellington. Uh, Ruan invited him in. And Peter Pollock is an old-time evangelist, old-time evangelist, man. And he stood there, and, he, and he's quite, he's like a, and he, and he really preached to the guys with his big thing, and he kind of preached to us. I want to say that I squirmed in my seat. It made me realize, like, outside of Jesus, I'm such a bad person. And you know what? That was good. And I, it's like we don't make people squirm enough. <laughs> well, yeah. But it's just bad news, isn't it? And then the gospel off the back of that is the spectacular good news and the surprising news that God takes failures and he takes the punishment that was, should have been on me and he puts it on Jesus. That he takes the debt that was mine that I racked up that I could never pay God back for and he puts it on his son. And he takes the righteousness of his son Jesus and he puts it onto me. And that the cross is the place of divine exchange where I receive his righteousness and he receives my sin. And everything I do from there is a place of response to this grace. And, you know, salvation, saving faith, isn't obviously just a mental ascent saying, yes, I believe, I know Jesus died for my sins. But it's really, really, really believing that Jesus took my place. It's a wholehearted leaning into Jesus, trusting in Jesus alone to deliver me. And then when the father looks at me, he sees the perfect picture of his son. And you know, I often have not believed this for myself. Because I wake up in the morning, I go through the day, and I often don't feel like Jesus. I don't feel very holy or spiritual. I know that's surprising for some of you, because you think I am. But often I don't, and I feel, I feel kind of... I just feel, you know, because we, we're surrounded by the world and we pick up, there's the presence of sin all around us and there's, a, something, there's something of the residue of the old man that's in us, the flesh that just kind of, until Christ comes back again, we, we're on this journey and we feel, and I know I have to speak to myself again and again saying, I'm not going to listen to myself, I'm going to speak to myself and I'm going to speak to myself and remind myself who I am in Him. And I want to say that there's power there because what He does is He reshapes our desires and out of that place we can say no to sin we can love God. It's like there's this fountain that bubbles up, and we've got to do that. And so, you know, saving faith is not just um, a little bit of me and a little bit of God. Yes, Lord, I'll trust you, but you know, I also have to do my bit. Saving faith is a wholehearted leaning and trusting into Jesus. And you are sitting on those plastic chairs this morning. You're not kind of saying, you're not half sitting on the chair because you're scared that that chair is going to break in, are you? No, it's like you're full weight, man. <laughs> is, is, into, is on the chair. In other words, you, you're putting your faith in that. And in, in our salvation is that. It means that I'm not being like the Pharisee that is kind of trusting in my moral effort. I'm putting my full weight and my leaning every day into Christ. Lord, if it's not for you, 
Even though I'm a good person, God, I'm going to go straight to the pit of hell. God, I just throw myself at the mercy of Christ. And I'm leaning all my trust, not a little bit of me and a little bit of him. That's everything to do with him. And so I want to say that, that we, if this is even, you feel this, like to say, Lord, oh, Lord, would you just give me a revelation of Christ alone? And you know, it doesn't mean that therefore we can stay in that place and just therefore just sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary all day, every day. We've got to get the order right. And there are, we are called to devote ourselves, aren't we? We call to show, we call to keep our promises and be those that, that do it, but we do it because he's a covenant keeping God. We can lay our lives down, but we only lay our lives down in view of the mercy of God. And if you're a leader and you're preaching to people and you're telling them, lay your life down for Christ, lay your life down for Christ, but you never preach the beginning of Romans 12 in view of the mercy of God, you're going you're gonna to raise up a generation of people that are rooted in self and this, and, and the self-improvement gospel. That's all you're doing because you're just saying, yes, we've laid our lives down. No, 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 it's, it's, we only need it because it's a response to him doing it to us first. We can show hospitality and we're called to do that, opening up our homes to one another, but we do it because we understand that God has shown hospitality to us. And if you're preaching on hospitality, make sure that you're preaching or you're sharing or you're encouraging your friend along the aspect that actually God is hospitable towards you. Because do you know what it means to be hospitable? It means to love strangers. Isn't that what the gospel is? It's loving a stranger. That's what the Lord did while you were a stranger, an enemy, alien of his. And then lastly, I obey God. We are called to obey him. Even when we don't feel like it, but we obey him because we love him. And we love him because he first loved us. And, I, and now we know these things, but I want to make sure that when you tell people and you're leading them, make sure you tell them why. And so we root people in this. And this is, otherwise we root them into kind of a, a false, we make much of us rather than making much of him. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> I haven't forgotten you guys in the tent there. Love you, man. You guys, you're sacrificing for Jesus. In view of the mercy of God, you're out there. The second kind of false gospel that I want to look at is the therapeutic gospel. The therapeutic gospel. So if we looked at the first false gospel, which is a gospel of Jesus as the disciplinarian, Jesus is kind of a coach that's driving you on. He's never quite satisfied. He's always pushing you to do better. Now, there is some truth in that because the Lord obviously wants us to, to grow in, in him and do better, but it's rooted in that. This kind of Jesus is a, he's a religious therapist Jesus. This is Jesus that, that is kind of, man, he just, he's always in a good mood with you. Okay, now I'm going to be careful because I'm probably going to offend some of you. Let me just drink some water. This gospel message is a message that it focuses on a Jesus that is committed to your happiness. That this Jesus is committed for you to feel good about yourself. This Jesus' emphasis is saying, I believe in you. There's some truth in that, okay? But that's the focus of this gospel message. It's a positive feel-good Jesus. It's a Jesus that wants you to have your felt needs met, experiencing personal worth and significance, helping you to realize your inner potential. This God, this Jesus, is never in a bad mood with you. You're always under grace. Now, I want to say firstly that this Jesus, if we look at the, the, the books in the New Testament, this seems like a different kind of Jesus to the Jesus that Ananias and Sapphira experienced in Acts chapter 5. Was Jesus in a good mood with Ananias and Sapphira saying, you know what, don't worry, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, but that's okay. Well, this kind of Jesus seems like a different Jesus to the one we see in Corinthians when the Corinthians were abusing the body of Christ gossiping, slandering, taking one another to court, abusing the, the, at the communion table where some of them got sick and were dying among them. They were under the judgment of God. You know, that's, a, that's a different kind of Jesus. Or the Jesus in Revelation where he comes to Christian churches and he says to them, I've come against you with the sword of my mouth. 
Would you say that that Jesus was often in a good mood, was, was in a good mood with those people? He loved them. He loved them. But he spoke against their sin and the way that they lived. And unfortunately, there's a kind of message that's been perpetrated today where it's the, this grace message, this, hyper, this, this idea that you're always under friendly skies. And while I know that I'm secure in my salvation, that Christ loves me, that he's kind towards me. But he can resist the proud. And again, we've got to have a picture where we be careful that we don't so, so push one truth that we forget the other aspects of what Christ is like. Now, I want to say that in this gospel, there are some precious truths here. Because I don't want to trash what we said earlier, that when the father looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son. If your dependence is on Christ, that if you've put your faith in him, that he sees you as, as legally perfect and as, as righteous in his sights. But even as those that are children of his, my, my child, I love my, my son, man, but yo, he can get naughty sometimes. And I'm not always in a good mood with him, but man, I love him. And we've got Christian bestseller books today. We've got the largest church in America that is built. The, some of the largest churches around the world are built on this kind of thinking, this kind of premise, this kind of gospel. And it's, I want to say that this is another Jesus. It's a different gospel from the ones the apostles preached. It's a Jesus of the American dream rather than of Scripture. And, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a book. I want to read something just from a book. Um, I'm, I'm actually not going to mention the author of the book because I'm going to get into trouble. And, uh, and I don't want to focus on a specific person. You, you can speak to me one-on-one, -on -one, but the idea is that there's a system. There's, it's a culture of the way we bring into church this is really what I want to hit rather than focus on individuals. But there was a specific book that has sold over 5 million copies and espouses this kind of gospel. We've, some of it have it in our homes, on our bookshelves. Um, but I, I want to just go through this book review and explain the principles behind why. And just to give you an idea of what this guy says in this book review of a, a specific therapeutic gospel espousing book. Let me see what, what this book review says. The guy crits this book, it's from a respected Christian site, and he says about this book, the author of this, this gospel talks about God throughout the book, but it's not the God of the Bible he has in mind. The author's God is a little more than the mechanism that gives the power to positive thinking. Jesus himself is mentioned in the book, but one of those times, one of a few times that he's mentioned in the book and he actually said two or three times in the book, and one of those is the punchline of the story about a little tree who has bad self-esteem until he figures out that he's being turned into a cross on which Jesus is to be crucified. That story may have Jesus' name in it, but it's not a story about Jesus like the rest of the book. It's a story about feeling good of yourself, good about yourself. He should stop marketing his message as Christianity because it is not you simply cannot make reference to God, quote some scripture, call what you're saying spiritual principle, principles, spiritual principles, and pass it off as Christianity. That kind of thing will have people enlarging their vision and choosing their, to be happy all the way to hell. The really frightening thing about this book is that five million people have bought it, and a good portion of those have probably walked away thinking they've read the Christian gospel. They think they understand the message of the Bible, and it is me, my success, my self-esteem, my house, my car, my promotion. Here are five symptoms to show that you might live off the diet or be rooted, even part of your thinking, in a self-improvement gospel. Five symptoms. Number one, for you personally, you never think about or talk about the cross and the mercy of God in your life. You never have a revelation of the mercy of God and the cross. Number two, phrases such as confessing my sin is never spoken of and practicing ongoing repentance is not done. Could be a sign that you're rooted in this. Number three, you believe that God never wants you to experience suffering. Number four, you follow your heart's desires and think that God would bless. <sighs> okay.
Okay, I've got to slow down. I feel like a freight train at the moment. Okay, number two. We're at a conference, man. You've got to write quickly. <laughs> There's grace on you, bro. Kev. Okay, so number two, practicing phrases such as confessing my sin is never spoken of and practicing ongoing repentance is not done. Number three, you believe that God never wants you to experience suffering. Number four, <laughs> I, I'm going to go. You can, you can get the recording. You follow your heart's desires and you think that God will bless that because he wants you to be happy. And off the back of that, number five, you often find scriptures and have prophetic words to confirm that God endorses your desires. And this is called confirmation bias, and it's when you're trying to validate carnal desires and you try to spiritualize it. And so we find it rampant in the church. We find guys wanting to, and, and again, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend any of you, but actually I do. I want to actually unsettle you, man. I do. I want to actually, if this is you, I, I hope you get offended. No, I mean, I don't mean that. I'm, I, we want to picture up a Jesus that is, we just don't want to be rooted because the, we want to be rooted in the right God. We don't want to stand before him on that day and him saying to us, actually, you did these works in my name, but get away from me. I never knew you. We want to, so rather, so we see shades of this, this thinking. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, where Paul calls the Corinthians, he says, you're a people of the flesh. They were driven by their carnal desires, and they were trying to spiritualize it and make it seem, you know, spiritual. For example, some of them were formed in the church of Corinth. They were in different camps and groups in the church, and Paul writes about this. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 1, where he says, you've come, and some of you say, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter. And then another group says, no, 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 we're so spiritual. We're of Jesus. We, we're the spiritual group. But he, he points them out and he says to them, all you're doing is you're trying to spiritualize a divisive heart. They weren't really of the Jesus party. They say, no, 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 we don't follow men. You know, Poor, we don't follow those guys. We wouldn't want to put them on a pedestal. That's right. But meanwhile, there's couched in that was a sense of a divisiveness that actually was an independence, actually, rooted in self. They were of the Jesus party. Check it out. Also, we find in 1 Corinthians 4, where, and Andrew alluded to this yesterday, it was so helpful, where, where it mentions this, the theology of kingship, of being a king. And rightly says, and Paul actually was being very ironic with them, sarcastic even. And you know, Paul's letters sometimes are sarcastic in order to get his point across. Some think that for us, sarcasm is our love language. I know myself and Mike Davies, we, that's our love language between one another. But Paul actually used sarcasm and irony in order to get his point across. And he's saying to them, you know, you, you, you want to, you, but all you're doing is you're endorsing. It's, 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 it's built in carnality. And you're trying to spiritualize something, but it's really rooted in self. You're making much of yourself. You want to reign on this earth. But it's not rooted in Jesus. They were grasping up rather than reaching down. And so I want to say to you that the gospel is not about collaborating with God to make your life more successful and, and happy. That we say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, follow me. Lord, I've got my agenda, I've got my, my, my vision and plan. Now, Lord, you buy into this. I claim that for me. The gospel is not about a better life. It's about a new life. It's about death and resurrection where God reshapes our desires to be ones of obedience and sacrifice and love. And it springs forth from that place. Does God give us a better life? Yes but it's about death and resurrection. It's from that root. And the therapeutic gospel never addresses the real problem. You know what the real problem is? Indwelling sin. It never addresses it. It minimizes it. It says, oh, don't worry, you covered over. And it doesn't address the fact that your nature and our nature 
outside of the gospel is fundamentally sinful and that it's so serious that we need a new birth. It's, we are so offensive to God that a miracle has to happen inside of us in, a, in, in order for us to come into the kingdom. Rather than saying to people, you know, great, to, this is radical change that takes place. And so the gospel, again, is the surprising news of what happens to us when we fail. And this Jesus of the Bible that we come to, when we come as those in a place of weakness, it's this Jesus that welcomes us, that showers us with grace and mercy and love when we do. And so I want us to look at a scripture, in, uh, two, just two quick scriptures in closing. 1 Corinthians 1.18, where he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, that's present tense, in other words, you're working out your salvation, once you've, you've come to Christ, it is the power of God. And so we've got to ongoingly come to the cross. We ongoingly repent. We ongoingly realize there's parts of us that are not yet redeemed into the image of the Son. And so we need ongoing faith, ongoing mercy. And I want to say to you, that we should continually have the attitude of the tax collector. Not saying, oh, I'm a worm, I'm a worm. Not that. But saying, God, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. That actually, that should be continually the attitude where that's the one that is justified before the Lord. And even as the king of the kid, kid of the king, that you are. Even as the child of the Savior, bought with his blood, that you are. You still come and say, Lord, Father, thank you for your mercy. Oh, Lord, but where I was and oh, for the surpassing grace of our, Jesus, of our Lord Jesus. And so in closing, I want to say that the true gospel gives power. The false gospels are like a wooden sword against the enemy. They will never help you to love God like you should. They will never help you to overcome sin like you should. There's power in the right message. There's power in the right Jesus. And he's Lord of all. And he's kinder than you could ever imagine. But he has an anger that we do not imagine. But thank God that it's been propitiated on the cross. It's been absorbed on the cross. But let's make sure that as believers, we stay on the right side of the cross. And so in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 11, where Paul goes back, and I want to end with the scripture, just the, where it says 2 Corinthians, oh, no, sorry, it was... 11 verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, it says that since we have a sincere, oh, no, no, wait, yeah, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And so guys, I just want to, I want us to come back again this morning to this Jesus. And for us to a sincere and pure devotion to this Jesus. So this gospel that doesn't curse us, that blesses us, that empowers us. And if there's anything in you that maybe you felt that the Holy Spirit has highlighted in the message, I want you to respond to the Lord. That maybe even a part that's been rooted in some of these thinkings. We're going to have a time where we're going to respond to the Lord and we're going to worship this Jesus this morning. Now I've hit a few things, but you can do that. It's fine. Is there anything you want? You can do that now. Uh, remember that amazing song that Karen sang about the banqueting table and God inviting us to come eat of Him. And um, earlier this week, also Val shared a word about fresh bread and just the Lord changing our diet and. I, I'm, I've got such an excitement in my spirit, not just for Mike's message this morning, but what we've heard yesterday and what's still to come, that God has prepared a feast for us that will change our appetite, that always will change our taste buds, that we'll have a new desire of the truth and the truth of the gospel, um, not the way it's twisted. And Mike spoke about that. And, and that we will not just eat well with this week, but we'll go away and say, never again. We'll spit out um, that other stuff. That even as we scroll through Facebook, even as we walk through a Christian bookshop, that we'll be super, super hungry 
for the pure truth, for fresh bread, for, for the banquet that Jesus laid out for us, the true Jesus. <laughs> Bow your heads with me. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we wanted to settle our hearts before you this morning. You're the bread of life. And so we come to you, Lord. You said that we need to come to you learn from you. And if there's anything in you this morning that, you've, that you felt the Spirit just highlight in your own life, that you know you need to just respond to the Lord. I know we've had a lot of ministry this morning, but it's been almost like a refreshing time of God watering the ground. But if, there's not, if you know there's something that needs to be, it's almost like a false way of thinking that you need to cast down. You need to um, pull it down, the stronghold. Or you need to highlight it and confess it. Just where you are, I just want you to stand. If you felt the Spirit just highlighting something, just stand where you are. Just, why don't you just speak to the Lord, just where you are. You speak to Him. Yes, Lord, for those that have stood this morning, we realize, Lord, in all of us, there's areas of our lives where we're not always rooted properly, Lord. The parts of understanding is we don't always see, and we, we know we see in part at the best of times. But it's... But Lord, for some that understood they've been rooted incorrectly, that their thinking is shaped more by other things rather than the Scriptures. Maybe even just an aspect of their leadership, aspect of them towards their family or their husband or their wives or his parents or to whatever it is, Lord. But Lord, we want to take those thoughts this morning. And your Word says we need to take captive those things. They need to be cast down. So Lord, would you come this morning and come and help to renew our minds that those thoughts would be cast down in Jesus' name. And that you'd come and bring a new way of thinking. That you'd come and transform our desires and our thoughts. That you'd come and give a fresh picture of the cross and of the mercy of Jesus, of the severity of Jesus. We're going we're gonna to worship and just fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. Like us, actually, all to stand.